think so. Uh, well, let's start with a recap of the last uh, uh, lecture because we, there is something we'll be will use uh, today. So I uh, last week I introduced I, I focus on particular model uh, which have a thin, which are thin chain Hamiltonians of this form. So they consist of a sum of terms uh, that uh, uh, can describe interaction along the z direction with the magnetic field. Then they have uh, uh, like uh, let's say opening terms, uh, so interaction between sigma x, sigma x, uh, and sigma y, sigma y, and also you can imagine to to uh, to consider longer range interaction, but uh, there is a, a caveat because you have to include in the interaction some strings of sigma z. Okay? Now, if you imagine to have this kind of model, thin uh, chain model, then uh, you can map the model to a non interacting a quadratic form of fermions. Through a so called journal vision transformation. Okay? As you see, this is a non local really transformation because it includes a string. Yeah? And you see there is also a privileged position, one, that you just can choose uh, uh, as you prefer. And then uh, this uh, uh, defines pairs of Majorana fermions that I call A. So they satisfy the anti commutation relation of Majorana fermions. And uh, notice that uh, for each side you have two Majorana fermions. Okay. Then uh, uh, the Hamiltonian can be written in this form after the transformation, and you have that it can be split in two sectors. Okay. The two sectors depends on the parity of the product of sigma z, so the parity of how many spin are flipped are in a given direction. And uh, uh, in each sector the Hamiltonian is free; it's not interactive. It's a quadratic form of fermions. So it can be parameterized by a matrix, H, two matrices, actually, one for each sector. And then these matrici matrices have uh, uh, the property to be purely imaginary, anti-symmetric, block circular matrices, or anti-circular matrices. So why this? First of all, because uh, we consider Hermitian Hamiltonian. So this is, and, uh, and because the major fermion is anti-commute, then this operator should be anti-symmetric and purely imaginary. About the structure, block anti circular structure, uh, comes from the fact that we uh, are considering translation invariant Hamiltonian with periodic boundary conditions. So, this, this implies that these uh, matrices have a simpler, uh, simpler form, okay, simple structure. And uh, so, what does it mean? For a generic matrix of this form, hmm, which is actually, I sketch here the, uh, the matrix, so you have uh, blocks, hmm, two by two blocks. And uh, block circular means that uh, all the blocks are equal along the diagonals. And then, uh, uh, depending on the boundary conditions, whether they are circular or anti circular, you have that the, the blocks at the corner uh, are the same as the blocks on the, on the diagonals or with the minus sign. So you have, you have to imagine this circular structure that you repeat the blocks. This simply means, okay, this is a, a, in the graphical uh, representation of the matrix. In practice, quantitative representation means that you can write the, the matrix elements in terms of a Fourier transform. And uh, if you write it, you can Fourier transform along this, uh, uh, the anti-diagonal, which means L minus N. Yeah. Mm -hmm. L and N are indices of the blocks, which in this particular case uh, select the site. So L corresponds to L site. And you know that there are two Majorana fermions per side. So this is why you have two by two blocks here. And then uh, and the, the free transform of this uh, is uh, a two by two matrix, because we have to free transform the blocks. Mm -hmm. And this is usually called in the mathematical literature symbol okay, of the, uh, the circle of top list matrix. Yeah? Just the this okay, symbol has prop two properties that come from the fact that the H is purely imaginary and symmetric, and this property does that uh, the symbol is Hermitian. Okay? And moreover, if you take the transpose of the symbol, then it's equal to minus the symbol with uh, reversing the, the sign of K. Okay? These are two the main properties of the symbol. Then if you, you can choose your whatever function. And this, every function you put here that satisfies this property, uh, um, identifies, completely identifies a non-interacting operator of, uh, um, of, the, of this form. Okay. So then we, this, uh, um, this representation is very useful, especially when you deal with commutators. 
because when you uh, consider the commutator of two operators of this form, so two non-interacting operators, then you find that the commutator takes the same form, exactly the same form, and now the matrices that characterize the operator are simply given by the commutators of the matrices that appear there. Mm? But now these matrices are very, uh, have very special properties. They are block, anti block circulant or anti-circulant. And so what happens is that you, you immediately know this. You can check it for exercise that if you now use the structure here, and then uh, uh, you, you find that also the commutator have the same structure again. So it's a block circulant or anti-circulant matrix. And the symbol of this matrix is just given by the commutator of the symbol. OK, uh, actually, you, you could find also a stronger property here. This holds true also if you consider just a product of two matrices. So this is just given by the product. But anyway, we, we only need the, uh, the commutators now. OK, so uh, this is interesting because it means that uh, every time that we want to zero a commutator between true and the operator, uh, this will be equal to 0 only if the, the commutator of the symbol is equal to 0. So if you are interested in finding all the conservation laws of this model, then we have to find all the operators, all the symbols that commute with the symbol of the Hamiltonian. Now, this symbol of the Hamiltonian is a very simple matrix, generally. It's a two by two matrix with a simple function of, with a simple function of k. So it's extremely simple to, to find the, the conservation laws. In particular, we know that uh, if you have a two by two matrix, which is independent of the identity, then the only ma independent matrix that commute with, uh, with this matrix are itself, the matrix, and the identity. You can imagine more than this, okay, if it's independent of the identity. So uh, it means that the generic conservation laws should be either proportional, the, uh, the symbol which is proportional to the symbol of the Hamiltonian, or can be proportional to the identity. So you have uh, two families of conservation laws. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what about this coefficient? Uh, if you are interested in uh, local conservation laws, mm -hmm. So what happens is that you are, uh, when you mean local, you realize immediately from this transformation from there that it means that you want this uh, uh, block circular matrix to have only a finite number of diagonals different from zero. But the diagonal here are related to the Fourier coefficients of the symbol, because here we are taking the Fourier transform. So it means that in order to have a local operator, you must have a, a finite number of, uh, uh, of non-zero Fourier coefficients. So this is indeed the meaning of locality in this language. So locality means that your symbol has a finite number of Fourier coefficients. You can extend this, uh, uh, this notion of locality introducing quasi-locality. When you say, OK, well, I, I really don't, I could, ex uh, instead of just consider operators that act non-trivially on a small part of the chain, I could consider operators which have some tail, maybe even exponentially small tails. OK, so they act everywhere in the chain, but they are just a very, they act uh, uh, lower, lower and lower the, 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 the farther away you go. These are called quasi-local. And in terms of symbols, it means simply that the symbols are smooth functions of k. Okay? Because well, if it's a Lefourier transform or a smooth function, has exponential tails. Okay? Because of this. OK, and then, OK, if we go back here to the families of conservation laws, we know that uh, this property fits essentially the, uh, if, you, if you are interested in local conservation laws, then what you find is that here you must have a, uh, a function with a finite number of Fourier coefficients, like cosine k, cosine 2k, cosine 3k. So this will be the local conservation law. The same here. So uh, a set is given by sine of uh, nk identity. So this is what we saw last time. And now I, uh, let's, uh, uh, where is, I, maybe better if I raise this part. Can I? I think, no, okay. <coughs> So in the end, last time, I, uh, we consider an example of the easy model, and we show the conservation laws. Notice that there was a typo in the end when I wrote the symbol. Uh, I wrote only a part of that was plus Hermitian conjugate. OK, of the last term. Just realize later. <coughs> but OK, now the reason why we, we are 
interested in this uh, controversial laws is because we wanted to describe the, the non-equilibrium dynamics in this model. No? So the idea was to uh, prepare your the state, hmm, in a given state, and then to consider the time evolution. Okay. So now, in general, even if the Hamiltonian has these uh, simple properties, this remains a hard problem if you consider generic initial state. So in order to be able to solve this problem, we have to assume also something for the initial state. In particular, what can be solved rather easily is the quench dynamics when you imagine that the initial state is the ground state of an Hamiltonian, which is non-interacting. Okay? So in this case, now there is a subtlety, but anyway, in this case, you can easily solve the dynamics. Okay, I immediately tell you where, where is the subtlety because it's, it's clear from there. Yes, exactly. And the, okay, you can also consider not only ground state, you can also consider thermal state of uh, non interacting Hamiltonian. Uh, you, you should consider what are called as later determined state. So, states for which you can apply the Vick's theorem. So we will consider a state where you have a, a, a you, you every time that you consider the expectation values of a string of Majorana fermions, let's write in this way. Mm. This can be written through the Vick's theorem. Oh, I write the expression, but it's a Fafian of a oh, zero, or zero, a i one, a i two, a i one, a i three, and so on. Here you have zero, you have here a i two, a i three, and so on, zero, and so on. So you construct an antisymmetric matrix with the two point correlators of the Majorana fermions. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, okay, uh, I'm not sure that you are familiar with the Fafian. Uh, this is a strange object. And essentially, uh, what is, I, 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 okay, it's not important the, the real expression, but uh, what I'm telling you is that the, the square of the Fafian is the determinant of the matrix. So here, up to the sign, is just the square root of the determinant. Hmm? Okay? And uh, in general, how can you, uh, if you want, you can fix the sign and knowing that the term, uh, the well, when you expand this, uh, this determinant, then you will have a term which corresponds to the product of the two-point function uh, pair like this, then sh it should have a, s a sign plus one, so well, a way to, to fix it. But anyway, you, if you're interested, you can uh, find the definition also on Wikipedia, so it's not really. So this is the, the kind of model we call slater determinant because all the correlation functions here, all the product, all the operators can be written in terms of the correlation function of the two of the two point function. Okay, can be written. Mm? And uh, uh, this happens in particular when you consider um, ground state of quadratic Hamiltonian. Mm? They have these properties. Ground state but also thermal state. They all have these properties. And if the time evolution is, uh, uh, is generated by an Hamiltonian which is non-interacting, that this, this property is preserved in time. So it means that we can just compute the two-point function, then from there we can extract then all the correlation functions of the model. This is why they are simple. And uh, OK, uh, just I want to mention the subtlety here. Because our Hamiltonian there, as you can see, is not just a quadratic form of fermions. There are two sectors. Mm? So if you imagine to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, when you, let's assume these are the, the, excite, the, the energy level, A0, A1, and so on, okay? then it can happen that you, you, have, you, you will have a, a subset of this level, which corresponds to a sector, and the rest to the other set. So maybe you have this, which is a sector, okay? and these are in the other sector, okay? Now what happens is that as long as the ground state 
is in one sector, mm? then it means that also the, it is the ground state of, uh, of a quadratic Hamiltonian and uh, everything is fine here. But now let's assume that for some reason, in the thermodynamic limit, these two levels approach the same value. Mm? This happens when you consider a model with a, in a ferromagnetic phase. So what happens is that the two lowest level becomes degenerate, and the, the symmetry, this symmetry, this spin-flip symmetry corresponding to that operator product of sigma z, is broken. So it's broken, so this means that the ground state is not anymore in one sector or in the other, but it becomes in a linear, in a superposition of the two. in the thermodynamic limit. When you do this, you lose this property. So you must be more careful. In fact, OK, the result doesn't change, but anyway, you, you must be more, more careful in the calculation. OK? So, so far, we will uh, uh, consider just the ground state of uh, non interacting Hamiltonia in, uh, uh, in disorder phases. So not in the ferromagnetic phase, without order. OK? Just to be, uh, not to have to take care of this complication. So we will have that the, uh, so what I mean is that we can assume that the H0 psi 0 is equal, for example, 1 over 4 A H minus 1 A, oh, plus or minus 1, 1 over 2, let's say minus 1, A uh, psi 0, which simply means that the product of sigma z applied to the ground state is a, uh, is a given number. So the, the ground state is a negative state of this operator. So this in this case, is equal to 1. Okay. This is what we will do. This is the assumption to simplify the problem. Yeah. Okay, one question related to the previous comment in the when you are a and the broken symmetry phase. From the point of view of Majorana, what, what does it happen? Do they take uh, well, what happens here is that OK, there are properties that, that don't change. Yeah. And in particular, if you uh, compute the expectation value of an even number of my own fermions, that they can be written still in this form. Okay, So no problem. But what happens is that while in, the, uh, in this case that we consider the expectation value of a node number of my own fermions is 0, so you have, uh, when you have i1, a i uh, odd number, so 2n minus 1, this is e exactly equal to 0, yes. yeah. OK? I, in the other case, it's not equal to 0. Hmm? So it's, uh, uh, the analysis is more, more complicated. And it's not so easy to write the expectation value of a uh, node number of uh, fermions. Hmm? Then, OK, something, uh, there are simplification when you consider the limit of infinite time, OK? But if you are interested in the time evolution, it's, uh, it's more complicated. OK, so these are the system that we consider, hmm? OK, now. And uh, uh, from what I wrote here, so from the Wicks theorem, what we need to know about the system uh, in order to, to describe correlation is the other two-point functions of the Majorana fermions. And uh, we can organize them in a matrix, because they are just two, 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 two by two. So we can uh, define the, a correlation matrix, which will be uh, well, like this, gamma ij, which will be defined as delta oh, ln, let's say. Oh, L, mm, yeah delta ln minus uh, the expectation value of a l a n. OK? This is just the definition. Uh, the, uh, these are the Majorana fermions. OK, if you know this matrix gamma, then you can uh, compute whatever you want. OK? Now, if you define the, OK, why there is delta ln? Because when uh, the, the square of a Majorana fermion is equal to 1. So this is to remove that, uh, uh, to remove the trivial, uh, the trivial part from this matrix. This matrix has some properties. This matrix is, first of all, Hermitian, OK? As you can check here, because when you compute the, the conjugate, these two operators uh, go in the opposite order. But then uh, you have to uh, you have to reverse them to to obtain the same ln. Gamma dag ln it will be equal to gamma ln. Anyway, this is 
it itself. <laughs> okay. okay, this is our mission. And uh, it's anti-symmetric because I remove the, the zero on the diagonal. And when you uh, uh, reverse L and N, then these two operator go in the opposite direction. So you they take a minus sign. So permission anti-symmetric. This implies that it's purely imaginary. Then OK, we, uh, as before, we have uh, the initial state it will be translation invariant again. So it means that this matrix will be a block Again, a block circular matrix. OK? So essentially, this matrix has the same properties that we already consider. So it means that we can define a symbol for the matrix, as we did before. So we can write gamma Ln is equal to, uh, as I wrote here, gamma, sorry, now we have the indices 12 minus 1 plus i to n minus 1 plus i is equal 1 over l sum k. Now we'll see what is this sign. e to the i l minus n k. And here you can define this. Okay. Gamma e to the i k i j. So as before. Now, the sign here, whether you are considered a circular or block circular, uh, sorry, a, a circular anti circular matrix, depends on the initial state. Because well, you, you, we chose a particular sector here. We said that this is the ground state of this particular Hamilton and not the other one with a plus sign. So, in this case, for example, this sign should be minus one. Okay? Okay, this is uh, a, a, actually a subtlety. Because if you imagine how to take the thermodynamic limit here, when you take the thermodynamic limit, this 1 over L sum becomes just an integral over decay. So you won't be able to see this effect of the, of the boundary. So what you see is that when you consider the limit, L goes to infinity, here you have the integral decay over 2 pi from minus pi to pi of e to the i L minus n k gamma e to i k i j. OK? So this is why I didn't, uh, wasn't very uh, uh, I didn't write anything here. Uh, when you consider Q theorem, then why did you choose exponential to be minus 1? Yeah, OK. Uh, when you, uh, in order to, to use all this formalism, we need the ground state to be, the median initial state to be the ground state of uh, a quadratic Hamiltonian. Here we have two quadratic Hamiltonian. So we have to choose in which sector we are. If you choose the sector, then you are fixing essentially the, the kind of matrix of H. So uh, depending on the matrix, you have one or the other. You, you have, depending on the which yes. boundary condition you have here, you have one or the other. Okay. And why would you minus one to be? Ah, this was just arbitrary. Oh, okay. All right, there is, a, 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 if you want, a, an observation that if you uh, do this problem in, uh, the easy, for the easy model that we introduced last time, then you find that the ground state is always in this sector, in the sector uh, called also Nebosch-Botz sector. So well, you have anti-periodic uh, boundary conditions for the fermions. So this is why I chose minus one. Okay. But uh, okay, but uh, as you see here, when you take the thermodynamic limit, this be become completely irrelevant. Okay, so this is just the information that is good to know, but not really important. Okay, so uh, this is our correlation matrix. So S for the Hamiltonian can be described in terms of a symbol, and now. Uh, where do I write? Uh, <coughs> OK, I want to keep uh, this part. Now, uh, I will uh, I tell you a result. I won't prove it. I tell you how to prove it if you are interested, or I can give you a reference. So let's imagine that now we want to consider a state, rho, okay, which is a thermal state. 
okay? or uh, uh, generally a state of this form, e to the q over z, mm? where q is a quadratic form of fermion. So let's write it here like e to the 1 over 4 a color sum uh, q in uh, one sector, whatever, uh, a. Okay, this can be, for example, a thermal state if here there is the Hamiltonian. Hmm? Yeah, I'm just saying, let's consider a generic uh, quadratic form. And now you are interested in the correlation matrix corresponding to this state. Hmm? So you want to compute the trace. You want to define gamma, as I define here. Gamma Ln equals delta Ln minus the expectation value in the state of the operator ALAN. OK? So there is a result. And the result is that this is equal to the hyperbolic tangent of, oh sorry, this is equal to, uh, um, OK, uh, we, we want to compute this. And now, OK, we, this is completely uh, characterized by the symbol. Mm? So what the result is that the symbol of this correlation matrix, so gamma of e to the ik, is equal to the hyperbolic tangent of the symbol of this operator. How can you prove this result? For example, a way is to use that this matrix is antisymmetric. So you can use that an antisymmetric matrix can be put in a block diagonal form by an orthogonal transformation. Uh, with this orthogonal transformation, you can diagonalize it, essentially. So you can define some fermions yeah, And in such a way that this operator becomes diagonal, uh, the exponent. And then you apply the same transformation here. Then you can check that this is what you, what you find. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you, well, uh, I can give you a reference where this is, that this is clearly not this is a standard uh, result, but I assume. So I'm not giving you the, the first reference. I'm just giving you a reference that I know that you can find this information. So uh, the reference is uh, so paper by me and uh, um, Pasquale Calabrese. I see. Okay. And the paper is journal uh, uh, stat fees. Uh, 2010, P04, 016. So here in the appendix, you find uh, this and the more uh, generalization when this Q is not Hermitian anyway. But uh, you, you will find also this result if you're interested, if you know how to do it. Anyway, so this is the, the result. This is a general mathematical result. Now let's assume that here you have the uh, ethermal state. So what happens? Now, if your rho, the density matrix, is e to the minus beta h over z, no? you have to, well, you can use this result. And then you, what you find is that the, the symbol of the correlation matrix mm, will be equal to minus the hyperbolic tangent of beta, the symbol of h. OK? Now, if you're interested in the, in the ground state, the ground state is the limit beta goes to infinity, the limit of zero temperature of a thermal state. Okay? So if we take here the limit beta goes to infinity, what do we find? The hyperbolic tangent is a function like this. Okay? Now what we have is beta, as this coefficient becomes larger and larger, then this approaches a sine function, the sine of this. Essential. Because every time that this is positive, beta is so large that you practically you are already here. And so you already see the value 1. And the same when it's negative. So the limit beta goes to infinity of this function is just minus the sine of h. OK. Um, I'm sorry, but I told you that h uh, hat was complex. H is a Hermitian complex, yes, but it is Hermitian. Oh, okay. So the eigenvalues are uh, real. This is why I can, uh, okay. can do this. Yes, 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 yes,
matrix that commutes with this, whose eigenvalues are the function of the eigenvalues. OK, I was assuming this may be a wrong doing. So a function of a matrix. OK, let's let a matrix be diagonalizable. Now I'm interested in the function of a matrix, so this, by definition, is equal to B, the base, diagonalize the matrix, a function of the diagonal parts of the eigenvalues times B minus 1. Hmm? This is what I mean. So what is the, I mean, the, the eigenvalues of H are of the same size? Yeah. Uh, there are some properties. In, in the easy model, you find that using the properties, these properties, what you can find is that the eigenvalues epsilon of minus k is equal to minus epsilon of k, or something like this. So you have, uh, if these are the eigenvalues, okay. this is what you find. So it's not really opposite. You don't find pair, but the eigenvalues at k are related to the eigenvalues at minus k. This is what you find. So oh, I guess yeah, but the problem is that d has many eigenvalues in general. Ah, what is this? OK. <laughs> OK, 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 sorry. No, sorry. No, no, that's not OK, uh, anyway, anyway, let me write this now. Yeah, you apply on all of the dependence of k. Yes. H is a 2 by 2 matrix, yes. There's two eigenvalues which will depend on k in a way it's described. Exactly, yes. And there's two eigenvalues that will sign. I don't know, what, what is the sign of the. They can be whatever they want. So what, when you write the sign of h, Ah, it's the sign of the eigenvalues. It can be also if they have the same sign, it just uh, this becomes the identity in that case. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, <coughs> okay uh, why I show you this? Because now, in general, uh, if you are interested in the correlation matrix in the ground state of the model, you should diagonalize the model and then you compute all these two point functions. And whatever. this is the standard way. Using this approach, well, in this formalism, actually, we infer immediately the result without doing any calculation here. I, OK, I use this, this, hmm, this mathematical results. And from that, we can infer immediately what is the correlation matrix of the, uh, of the ground state of a non-interactive model. And this correlation matrix, which uh, we will have a symbol, which is just the minus the sign of the symbol of the Hamiltonian. I'm confusing you too much. Oh, yeah, quest. <laughs> OK, fine. Now we are interested in the, in the time evolution. OK? So uh, yeah, I want to keep this. So now, the correlation matrix, gamma, that I defined before, at the time t, OK, will be defined as, again, OK, this is the elements ln, delta ln minus, now you have the expectation value, psi 0, e to the i, uh, sorry, e to the, yes, i, ht, then you have al, an, e to the minus i, ht, psi 0, OK? This is a quadratic form. This has two fermions. This is a quadratic form of fermions. Hmm? So what happens to the result that you can immediately understand is that this will remain quadratic. So this will be equal to some, uh, oh, some uh, j, j prime of a j and then there will be some uh, a j j prime a j prime l n okay so it will be this will remain quadratic why this is very simple to show I, if you know maybe the backer as of campbell theorem you know that every time that you have a, 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 
the time revolution if you want of an operator, so written in this form, then you can expand it in terms of commutators. So uh, I already showed you, I think, this when we discussed the Robinson. So what we have is that e to the i h t something, any operator o e to the minus i h t, can be expanded like the exponential. So you have sum over n, 1 over n factorial of i t to the n. Then you have the commutator, the nested commutator with the Hamiltonian and the operator. And the number of nested commutator is equal to n. Yeah. OK. So you have this, this equality. So now uh, you see that the, the commutator between h and o, because they are quadratic, is quadratic. So this property remains every time, because then you have to commute again with a quadratic operator, remains quadratic. So that means at, a, at each order of this expansion, this is a quadratic operator. In other words, this is quadratic. OK? And uh, we can apply all our formalism here, and uh, we find a very simple result. As uh, every time, OK, th there are some always calculation to do, but the result is always very clean and simple, this uh, formalism. Because then what you find is that the symbol of the Hamiltonian at the time t is simply given by, by e to the uh, minus i. OK, but let's, I want to write, OK, no, yes, let's do this. H, e to the i, k, t, the symbol of the Hamiltonian at the time 0, e to the i, h, This is what you find. And why you, you should expect this? Because every time that we commute this to operator, this commutator can be written in terms of the commutator of the symbols, in terms of the symbols. So here you have, not, you have just always, you can replace h by, the, uh, by its uh, symbol. And this is why you essentially obtain this. You recover then the time evolution in this form. OK, uh, so in this uh, rather abstract way, we immediately uh, can compute the, the correlation function at the time t. Hmm? Started from our initial state, which was the ground state of some Hamiltonian. So let's call the. So we define the gamma, the symbol of the uh, state at the initial time, which was equal to the minus the sign of our Hamiltonian at the initial time, h0. So this is the symbol of h0. Then at the time t, we have this. Okay. We have this, and this is the symbol of h. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, this I, I assume that the initial state was just the ground state. Mm -hmm. We could uh, consider a, a finite beta here, and just I had to replace this uh, sign here by the tangent, the hyperbolic tangent of, uh, of H0. So if you, uh, and this is what uh, we will do probably in a second moment. But so this is our, um, so for the quench, which is the quench is H0 psi 0 ground state psi 0. And then you have um, psi t is equal e to the minus i h t psi 0. We are considering this. Sorry, but I confused by the formula um, for the density matrix. Uh, yes. The there, you, you have the generic uh, H or the H uh, which is uh, quadratic. Okay. What you okay for the, 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 the this formula holds for the uh, quadratic, ah, quadratic Hamiltonian. Ah. But you can imagine that if you now consider the the you, the, 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 big the big one, what you have, oh, it's not written here. Anyway, what you have is that you have two sectors. So you still have to select the two sectors. Ah, okay. 
but what happens is that, okay, why I didn't uh, stress this too much? Because when you consider thermodynamic limit, these two operators are becoming exactly the same. <laughs> so you don't see the difference. So that's why, um, okay. And, uh, and this is, uh, should be clear because when we are considered two point fungi, now we are considered periodic boundary condition. The problems are at the boundaries. No? So if you consider the thermodynamic limit, this effect of the boundary will disappear. So you should, if there is no broken symmetry. So you, mm, this is why then the boundaries here, I'm, uh, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not keeping any more the knowledge of whether k is quantized in a, 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 like 2 pi over l or like 2 pi n plus 1 half over l. So I'm, uh, I'm already here, this, this formula hold in the thermodynamic limit and also in a finite system if you quantize k in the right way. But this information is really uh, hidden here. Okay. So uh, this is the time evolution of the correlation matrix. Okay. Now uh, we would like to, uh, to see what happens at large times because our aim was to describe the, uh, the stationary properties, so the limit of infinite time here. So again, when you consider <coughs> if you want to come back to the, to, the, uh, to the correlation matrix, given the symbol, then you have to apply this Fourier transform. Hmm? So let's assume that you are interested in local observable. Local observables will be written in terms of the uh, Majorana fermions with some indices. OK, they can be also more. OK, we are just interested in the two-point function. So these indices cannot be arbitrary far away from each other because the operator is local. So this means that there will be only a finite number of sides between them. So L minus N is fine in the thermodynamic limit. And it's fixed because we are fixing the observable. So you say, OK, now I'm interested in this particular observable. I fix L and N. And then I want to uh, compute the, the matrix element of the correlation matrix, but these two, value, L and N. This will be given by the Fourier transform. Mm? Let's take the thermodynamic limit. As I showed before, this becomes an integral. So you, this will become the expectation value. Uh, it will be something like, uh, OK, now it will be an integral in the K over 2 pi of the Something like this. Okay, now I'm. Uh, yeah, I should be writing something like 12 minus 1 plus i. Okay, let's do it. 12 minus 1 plus j. Mm. Let's say I consider this. So here you have l minus n, and then you will have here the symbol of the correlation matrix index i and j. This is in the thermodynamic limit. Now you, uh, we, uh, what is it? Now we want to compute this, this operator, this expectation value at large time. So we have to, uh, at a finite time. So we have to use this, uh, this expression here. No? Now when you use this expression, then you, uh, what can you do? You can, for example, expand this in terms of the eigenvalues of H, mm? because these are matrices. So let's see what happens if we expand it. So we want to write. So okay, the aim is to is to obtain the the large time behavior of the correlation functions. Okay. So I want to okay, gamma. I want to op obtain this expectation value at the time t. Hmm? This is my aim. Now I have to use that expression there. And so I can write the, the expression like this. So gamma, OK, this, this matrix element. Maybe there is a minor sign here. Hmm. OK, anyway, by definition. Yeah. So a to l minus 1 plus i, a to n minus 1 plus j at the time t approaches minus the integral dk over 2 pi of e to the i l minus n k. Then you have the term there that I can write as the sum over s of 1 plus
Mm. H. So let's simplify a bit things otherwise. Um, okay, let's simplify a bit the, the, the Hamiltonian. Okay, we, we consider the Hamiltonian of the easy model, for example. Okay, like otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm doing things too much generally. So if you consider now the transverse field icing chain, what I wrote last time is that this H is equal to some uh, special relation times no. can be written in this form. There is a sigma y here. Mm. OK, let's focus on this. Otherwise, uh, it's too much complicated. So this is the easy model. The easy model where the Hamiltonian defi is defined in this way. OK. So this is a, in a particular case. We consider this for the sake of simplicity. Now, the eigenvalues of this, mm, as you can see, are uh, plus or minus epsilon. Because this is a, uh, this matrix squared to 1, sigma 1, e to the minus i theta sigma z. So what we have is the eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. So what you. So we can distinguish them by the sign of the eigenvalues. And so what we can write is, in this case, is the, uh, well, what we have, you can expand in the, in the uh, two sectors, whether the eigenvalues plus 1 or minus 1, which correspond to put a projector here, 1 plus s sigma y e to the minus i theta k sigma z over 2. And then in k, this gives you the sign of this operator. And so you will have e to the uh, minus i s epsilon of k t. I write it and then I explain why it's easier. OK. And here you will have the uh, matrix sine of h 0 e to the i k. Yeah, I will have um, i s prime epsilon kt. And here we have the projector sigma y e to the minus i theta k sigma z over 2. So what am I doing here? I have to rewrite this operator. This is exponential of a matrix. So in principle, it's a bit complicated. What I'm doing is that, OK, I, I know how to compute the exponential of the eigenvalues. Hmm? And I know here the eigenvalues are plus minus epsilon. So this part here project on the eigenstate of sigma y of this matrix here with eigenvalue equal to s. Hmm? So for these eigenvalues, the exponential is simply given by e to the minus i s epsilon. This is the corresponding eigenvalue. And I have to sum over the two sectors, because I have one, uh, the, particle, the contribution from the uh, eigenvalue s epsilon and the contribution from minus s, uh, sorry, plus epsilon and minus epsilon. So this is why I sum over s. And then I do the same here on the other side. And there is a sum of s prime. Mm? So why I did this because now we have that the, the time appear only in a scalar. So there is no matrix here anymore. I, I just decided to, um, <coughs> to um, isolate the matrix part of this operator. Why I'm doing this now? Because well, we want to compute this L minus n is uh, fixed. It's a given number. Yes? The indices i and j does appear somewhere. Yeah, sorry, yes, you're right. There is an i. OK. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hmm. I have to write. I have to. OK. Let me write this. I have to exchange the two, otherwise it's complete. This is e to the minus i s epsilon of k t. Here you have the projector, 1 plus s sigma y e to the minus i theta k sigma z over 2. And then you have here 
uh, I have to do the same here. One uh, plus s prime sigma y e to the uh, minus i theta k sigma z over two. And here you have the indices i j. Mm? And then you have e to the minus i s minus s prime epsilon k t. Ah, I already brought that, but the remove from here. That's what it is. Sum s s prime. OK, this is the expression. So these are the indices i and j over here. Hmm? So you see, yeah, you, you should have to compute the, uh, the matrix element of this two by two matrix. OK, this is something that, uh, well, clearly we need to know what is h0 to do this. Otherwise, how can we do? But nevertheless, uh, there is something that we can infer immediately without uh, knowing, without assuming anything about h0. And what we can see immediately is that uh, what's the behavior for large time? Because now, OK, this is just a, well, this is a smooth function of k. It's from minus pi to pi. You see here that uh, if s is uh, uh, different from s prime, then here you have a phase, a time dependent phase. But in the limit of large time, this becomes extremely uh, a rapidly oscillating phase. And we can use the uh, riemann lebesgue lemma to say that all these terms, okay, because they are rapidly oscillating, ap approach zero in the limit of infinite time. Hmm? So it's like when you, you integrate the function with something which is oscillating extremely rapidly, so this average to zero. So this means that in the limit of infinite time, if time goes to infinity, what you find is the only, only the diagonal path s equal s prime here. This operator. So you find sum over, OK, you have again the integral. OK, and then here you have sum now just over s, because s prime is equal to s. Uh, yes, OK. And then you have this minus i theta k sigma z over 2 sine of h0. And then you have 1 plus s sigma y i theta k sigma 0 over 2. Yes, of course. Uh, that's OK. Epsilon k is equal to uh, this. Uh, there is a minus. No. 2j square root of h minus cosine. Oh, easy. So it's 1 plus h square minus 2h cosine of k. Uh, the J is here. OK. Mm. So this would be H in this case. So this vanishes at a critical point, H equal to 1. This won't change the result, because it would vanish just for a point, which has a, a, a zero measure when you integrate. So this could change the corrections, without doubt. Uh, it has effect, but not on the fact that this term approaches 0. Okay. So uh, this is the final result. Mm? So we were able to take the, the infinite time limit. What did we use? Because it's important, this part. We used that, that this L minus n are finite, are fixed. Mm? So we use, in fact, that, that we were considered local operator here in order to take the limit. Because if you imagine now that, uh, let's assume that you had these indices uh, with a distance uh, proportional to the system size. Then, first of all, we couldn't replace the sum by an integral, because now we would have some dependence of the, of the system size here. So something would have been more complicated, without doubt. We couldn't use the riemann lebesgue lemma to, uh, to, um, to show that the, the, uh, some terms go to 0. So the result would, be, would have been different. So we use this. Mm. And then we found this result. But now, OK, what we can do, we can, uh, uh, given the result, we can do a step back and say, then I recognize this as the symbol of my stationary state. 
What I mean is that in order to do this, we had to consider a particular class of observables. The final result, nevertheless, has the same structure. So what I'm now saying is that, well, in our class of observables, for our class of observables, taking the expectation value in our state at large time is equivalent to take the expectation value in, this, in the state which corresponds to this particular symbol. So this is what defines the symbol of my generalized Gibbs ensemble. So in order to find this, we have to restrict the class of observables. But then we say, OK, then we, for this class, I can replace the state by this one. Because this was, this is the oh, sorry, sorry, is the you you are right. Sorry, this is the gamma. This is the symbol of the correlation function in the GG. Oh, sorry, yes, you're right. And then, if you want now, if you are interested in the, sorry, it's not written here. Um, exactly inverting using the arcotangent. If you are interested now in writing, OK, this is gamma GG. Now, how is it defined gamma GG? Gamma GG is uh, <coughs> uh, What's the problem that you are seeing now? What's the problem? Uh, repeat. Uh, no, I was wondering if you could, uh, OK, maybe, maybe you would, you would talk about that. Here we are considering infinite temperature already. Yeah? Yes, it was here, the temperature. Uh, yeah, but OK, then you have the uh, sine of gamma is equal to the, the sine, uh, no, sorry, the, the sine, so sine and sine are mm -hmm. uh, symbol of gamma is equal to the sine of the symbol of H. Yes. Infinite yes. That's Yes, this is, I, I, this is what I wrote here. Yeah, okay. But still, this, uh, you see that you have to compute all this part. Yeah. You have to project this sign yeah, yeah, yeah. on this. So when you project it, then you find something which is not, uh, uh, which is not just a sign. This is not just a sign of something. No, yeah, OK, OK. Mm. But I was wondering uh, how, you, how you compute the sign of, uh, of rho from the sign of gamma, let's say. Uh, you uh, well, what do you, no, no, what do you, what? If I understand, let's uh, let's write the definition. Otherwise, here we. Uh, symbol, oh, I say. Indeed. Okay. Let me let me write this. So this is gamma gg, which by definition is delta l n minus the expectation value in the gg hmm, of again a l a n. This is definition. And then I found the symbol of this. So gamma gg. Is equal to whatever the sum over s of the projector. The other was the sine of h zero e to the i k, and the projector here. Okay, this was my result. Now gamma rho g, g can be written as the exponential of something. If I understood, I think you were saying something like this. So I can rewrite gamma g, g as I presented in the past. Uh, hmm? Let's say cool GG. I wrote something like this. And this was a linear combination of the uh, local conservation laws last time. So how do you find the symbol of this? Well, we can use the inverse relation, because I told you before that the, the, uh, uh, the symbol of the GG should be equal to the hyperbolic tangent of the symbol of this Q. Okay. Oh, okay. So what happens is that if you are interested in the symbol of Q, hmm, then you have to just to take the uh, arcotangent of this quantity here. Okay, yeah, I was confused because I was thinking about the, the, the sign of state, the stationary state was like uh, an infinite temperature thing. It won't, no, 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 it so won't. No, no, this was, uh, sorry, a beta in infinite means zero temperature. Uh, Don't confuse, it was, okay. Uh, 
but I, I thought in this expression would have a, a sign instead of the hyperbolic range. And so I was ah, no, no, no. The, okay, I want to stress again that the, while here this object has just like a minus plus or minus one, yeah, yeah, yeah. when you project, uh, you find something which is like a minus different from plus or minus one. This is why it, and this object is generally uh, non trivial, it's not just a sign. Still, there are some uh, uh, pathologies that you that are related to what you are uh, to your doubts, I think, because what you um, what you find is that okay. If you want, okay, I I can uh, this expression can be can be simplified. If you use the initial Hamiltonian, it's an easy Hamiltonian as well, okay, with a different magnetic field. So we consider quenching the easy model. So let's assume that also H0, where I wrote the Hamiltonian. Oh, I erase it. Okay, so now we, we assume that H0 is again minus J, sum over L, something like this, H0 sigma LZ. So that the symbol H0 is uh, the same as the symbol of H, as I wrote before. The only thing that changes is this uh, Bogoliub of angle, and it will change the dispersion relation. Mm? Okay. So if you do this, we can write for this particular example, example. Mm. What you find is that uh, this gamma GG can, is given by, yeah? so gamma GG. minus sigma y e to the i theta of k sigma z. Then you have here the arc arcotangent of cosine of theta of k minus theta of minus k. You see theta minus k, theta zero of k. So you can compute it if you, if you just replace here h0 now by epsilon 0 e to the i theta 0. This is what you find in this particular case. There is an arcotangent of this. Now, I, uh, we, uh, last time we discussed the locality properties of the symbols. And in particular, we infer that in order to have a, a, local, uh, a local operator, this should have a finite number of Fourier coefficients. In order to, be a quasi, to have a quasi-local operator, it should be a smooth function of k. Now the problem is uh, that uh, if you now uh, study the properties of this, then you realize that this is not really a smooth function in 0 to pi. There are some singularities. The singularities come from the fact that if you imagine a this, I didn't uh, uh, tell you the properties of the Bogolubov angle, but it's clear uh, y y if you do the calculation, you realize immediately that theta is a node function of k. Mm. So in particular, what you have is that for k equals 0, for example, this becomes equal to 0. The cosine of 0 is equal to 1. The arcotangent of 1 diverges. So you can immediately see that here there, can, there are some pathologies. Mm. And if I plot uh, the, uh, if I uh, if I plot the uh, dispersion relation of the GG, hmm? so imagine if I diagonalize now the GG and I plot it the dispersion relation, what I find is something like uh, this. Okay, now this is just a sketch. So this will be epsilon of uh, of GG as a function of k. I will have uh, a divergence here, and generally I have also divergence at pi. It will be something like this. Let's say. This is not really a smooth function. This, diver this is a logarithmic divergence. Mm -hmm. So one could actually wonder. There was a, for a long time, I think, this was a problem in, uh, in our community. Uh, to, to understand how is that possible, that we always want to uh, describe this kind of quantum quenches using the local conservation laws, quasi-local conservation laws. Then we, uh, we do this simple calculation, for example, and then we realize that there are, uh, it seems like that our assumptions are not satisfied in this, in this model. Because then what we have is that uh, this Q, where is the, where, this Q, hmm? we assume that can be written in terms of the local conservation laws. So it should be 
we hope to be uh, that the, in the end it should be a quasi-local operator, but instead is not a spoot function. Mm. And, uh, uh, and this is why I think uh, still uh, some people don't like uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, describing the long-term behavior uh, just uh, considering the, uh, the local conservation laws or the quasi-local conservation laws. I, I tell you what is the solution in this, of this problem. Uh, this problem, first of all, it's uh, always uh, also present in the interactive model. If you consider a quantum quench in the uh, even x -X model, whatever, you find this kind of singular behavior. Uh, this was observed in Lieblinegar as well. So it's a rather, rather general uh, problem. The, uh, the physical reason why this happened, this can happen, is that uh, uh, there are conservation laws in this model that the, for which the ground state that you consider is an eigenstate. Okay, so in a sense, you, when you consider time evolution, the space in the Libra space uh, that you are accessing is cut in the wrong way because you are uh, choosing a very special initial state, which are also, I guess, state of some conservation laws. So this creates some, some problems. And this is actually the, the source of this kind of, uh, um, of divergences. And in particular, you can show in, in non-interactive model that there is an infinite set of conservation laws that uh, uh, are conserved both in the original Hamiltonian, in the zero time Hamiltonian, at, at both before the quench and after the quench. I, for example, the conservation laws that are proportional to the identity, have the symbol proportional to the identity. Those conserved operators are always conserved. Hmm? So this is an example of something which is, uh, 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 which constrained your, uh, your Hilbert space, the time evolution. And uh, in fact, you can, uh, well, uh, you can convince yourself that these divergences are due to this, to this problem. But instead of doing that, I prefer to fix the problem, okay? Because it's very simple. And the observation is that uh, if we now we do all the calculations that we did so far, but instead of starting with the uh, ground state of the model, we start with a finite temperature, arbitrary small temperature. We do all the calculation again. What happens here is the, the effect of the temperature is that in this, in this expression, you will have a further tan an hyperbolic tangent of beta epsilon zero of k over two. This is the only difference in the result. So beta appears here. This is the temperature of the initial state. And indeed, if beta goes to infinity, this becomes just the um, this should be somehow equal to, this is the, yes, this special is positive, okay. This becomes equal to one, okay. But what happens is that now you see that because there is a beta, a final beta here, well, every time that this is equal to one, these terms will make the, the argument of the arcotangent smaller than one. So you want them singularities. So now if you do the same, you plot here now, uh, the same dispersion relation for a final beta, large but finite, what you find is this. This is a smooth function. And now, okay, uh, you, could want, you could question now that the, we are changing the initial state, no? Because now we are considering a different initial state, which is a, a term, thermal state. But now if you consider that we always start with uh, non-critical models, so there is a gap in the spectrum. So if the temperature is small, you won't see the effect of the uh, of a very uh, of the gap, uh, the effect of the temperature. So you can really approximate your thermal state by the ground state of the model. So in fact, uh, this suggests you that uh, even if there are some uh, apparent pathologies here, when you consider quenches from the ground state, you can immediately fix them. You can fix them by saying that if you consider a small temperature, you solve the problem for a small temperature, and then you take the limit beta goes to infinity. And this operator then becomes quasi-local for each finite temperature. So in fact, you can, this means that you can uh, expand it in the local conservation laws of the model. So there are pathologies in the limit beta goes to infinity, but at any finite temperature, this is a quasi-local operator. Mm. So you can expect, in particular, that you can uh, rewrite this in, uh, in terms of the local conservation laws. And this is what, what's true. Eh? Even for beta goes to infinity, you can write it as a series of, 
Docker conservation laws. Is it? Uh, hmm? Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Yes, OK. OK, uh, this QGG is a, a quadratic operator, so you can diagonalize it. Hmm? If you diagonalize QGG, QGG, then you find, you can, uh, well, you, you find the, uh, some fermions you define. And then the, in the end, it will be equal to epsilon GG of K. And then here you have some fermions, C, that K, K minus 1, R. B, let's call it B. And this is the dispersion relation. <coughs> OK. Uh, if you're fine, I can give you five minutes, and then we. And uh, uh, epsilon 0 is always positive. Yes, epsilon 0, uh, by definition, OK, this is, um, generally, I, I define epsilon 0 as the excitation over the ground state. Okay. So this is why it's always positive. Um, otherwise, OK. Let's really do this, and it's uh, it's fine here. Yeah. No, I'm wondering if it is zero. Otherwise, uh, beta times zero. Okay, indeed. Okay, no. no okay, uh, this is true. I um, this problem can be easily fixed when the initial state is non-critical. Hmm? For the critical state, in fact, is that uh, uh, here you can have uh, some uh, issues. Okay, so I'm. Uh, uh, you know, this lecture, I, I, really, I really try to avoid uh, considering critical, uh, critical system. So here we are, we are considering quenches in non-critical system where there is a gap in the Hamiltonian. So, and everything can be seen uh, easier in an easy way. But I, yeah, I, I agree that uh, if now this dispersion relation approaches zero, then there is a problem of uh, computational limits. So maybe there is something interesting to, to see. OK, so the last three hours have been uh, rather technical, I would say. So we consider special models, uh, non-interactive models. And we, we, uh, I try to show you that uh, um, all our ideas of uh, relaxation actually can be proved, can be seen in this model. And, uh, but now I want to come back a bit on the general uh, physics. OK, so uh, for, uh, at least, for at least half an hour. And uh, um, instead, okay, first of all, what we saw is that we, uh, we consider systems time evolving after quantum quenches, and we have been interested in the expectation values of observables. In general, if you do this kind of numerical studies, for example, what you find is that these expectation values uh, generally have a non trivial time dependence, they can oscillate in time, and then you find this uh, stationary value. No? And then we try to describe this kind of uh, plateau, the stationary value of the observables. The claim was that you can, uh, you, you can uh, capture this behavior introducing a, a generalized Gibbon ensemble or a stationary state, which is written in terms of the charges of your system, the quasi-local charges. Now, this, the set of charges depends on, your si on the system that you consider. So if, uh, uh, for example, we are considering a non-interactive model, in non-interactive models, you have infinitely many charges, okay? or also an integrable model, more in general, interactive integrable models. If you consider generic systems, you can't find many, many charges. Maybe you can have some symmetry like particle conservation, but okay, there are no many conservation laws. And in the most generic system you can imagine, you have only the Hamilton. Only the Hamilton is conserved. So this means that this, uh, um, the, uh, this conjecture of EGG in the systems corresponds to conjecture the emergence of a Gibbs ensemble, something which is uh, just a, look like a thermal ensemble. This ensemble depends on a parameter beta, which is an effective temperature, which can be fixed by the only conservation law that you have, by the, uh, the energy. The energy is fixed during time evolution. So in order to fix this, what you do is that you, you impose that the expectation value of H should be equal, in this general Gibbs ensemble, should be equal to the uh, to psi 0 H psi 0. Hmm? Okay, so you impose the integrals of motion, and then you find a particular value for beta. Now, in general, I, I, if uh, no, in general, I, if you consider now this integrable model, this non-interactive model, what you find is that this GG is different from uh, from a Gibbs ensemble. So when you study time evolution, the plateau can cannot be described by a thermal. 
And if you do, if you try to do this, you find uh, some discrepancy here. Uh, a discrepancy which is generally large, okay, it's not small. But uh, uh, because of this, uh, because of this effect, the fact that these two expectation values are very different from one another, we can actually have a very interesting phenomenon in this quench dynamics. This phenomenon was named pre-terminalization. Okay. What's the essential idea? Well, imagine now that uh, our Hamiltonian, H, can be decomposed in two parts. So you have an unperturbed part of the Hamiltonian H0, plus then you will put some perturbation, G and some potential V. Now let's assume that this Hamiltonian, H0, has many symmetry. It's an extremely symmetric Hamiltonian, like okay, it's integrable. It describes an integrable mode, integrable system. It tests infinitely many conservation charges, local charges. Okay? This is just an assumption. And for example, H0 could be the easing Hamiltonian or uh, the model we considered in the, in the past hours. This V can be whatever. You can choose your uh, perturbation and uh, uh, generally, what you do, you want to break all the symmetries. So you want this to be a completely generic Hamiltonian. Okay? So V, well, uh, a simple example, we can imagine, so H0 is the Hamiltonian of the easy model, example. Right. I write again. And then we can add a perturbation like next nearest neighbor. For example, we can add a magnetic field in the x direction and whatever you want. If you do something like this, you, really, you are destroying almost everything in this Hamiltonian. Okay? Uh, yeah, even this Hamiltonian is already non integrable if you consider just this term here. Okay? So if you also add the uh, next to nearest neighbor interaction, this is a, uh, there is no way that this won't be integral. Let's put uh, 0.3. Okay, so this Hamilton doesn't have any particular symmetry. So this means that the, uh, now if you apply our uh, physical picture, it means that if we wait sufficiently long time here, we should find a thermal state. Okay, so now we study the time evolution of our observable. This is the time, we should go whatever. And then in the end, it should reach the thermal expectation value. So this was the thermal. No, because this is a generic Hamilton. Now the one of the problem is okay, how much time do I need to reach this expectation value? Because you can see that now if G is small, for a long time window, you can see the effect of the perturbation. Because if you are, in particular, considering times such that g t, okay, there is also a g is the mention full here. So g t, let's imagine that you are in this limit. g t must be smaller than uh, 1. Okay? And then, uh, but still the limit is t, which is very large. j t is much larger than, right, yeah, okay, much larger than 1. This limit can be, well, you can imagine that there is a time window with this limit if G is sufficiently small. And in this limit, you have that uh, since G times T is small, when you consider the time evolution under this Hamiltonian, you can really neglect the effect of, the, of this perturbation. Mm -hmm. If we couldn't do that, it means that we couldn't study physics because it would mean that uh, all the possible perturbation would have changed the uh, the physics, the time evolution at any uh, small time. So this is just the basic, <laughs> if the basic thing that should happen. If G is sufficiently small, I can forget about this part. So this means, but uh, if I forget about that part, it means that I should expect the thermalization, the, the relaxation to GG, because this Hamiltonian has small symmetries. So this means that uh, I should expect, like before, because essentially it's the same time evolution, yeah, there will be a plateau. But yeah, then should happen something. Okay? 
So this uh, plateau that you can see in the limit where the parameter g is small are uh, known as pre-thermalization plateau. Okay? So they come before pre-thermalization. -thermal, before you are that you, you know that uh, for very, very long time you should have that the observer should reach the thermal expectation value. But then if your Hamiltonian is close to an integrable point or is close to a, a, a Hamiltonian with more symmetries, then you can you should expect uh, the existence of other uh, quasi-stationary behavior, mm. which are referred to uh, as pre pre-thermalization. Okay, now let's be just a bit more quantitative, okay, in this time. And so what we can do is that to, to treat GV as a perturbation, G is small, so we start to working out the time evolution operator, assuming that G is small. What I want to do, uh, you know, I think for sure, uh, almost all of you, I guess, but uh, the interaction picture, okay? Uh, this is, uh, especially in high energy, this is what, uh, what is usually done when you want to uh, develop a perturbation theory with a Feynman uh, diagram and so on. What I present, I'm presenting here is the opposite of the interaction picture. Because, okay, we, our state at the time t is written as e to the minus i h0 plus gv t applied to psi 0. In the picture that I want to propose, which is extremely, uh, it's just the opposite of the interaction picture, I want to make the state to evolve under the unperturbed Hamiltonian. Okay? So what I do is this. This is equal to e to the minus i h0 plus g v t e to the i h0 t e to the minus i h0 t psi 0. I just put an identity here. Mm. But now I want to, I will apply this to the, to the state. Instead, I will apply the rest to the operator. Mm. But before applying to the operator, I want to manage a bit uh, uh, to, 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 ma uh, to, uh, to rewrite this in a different form. Okay? So let's consider this, this object here. Let's call this u equal to e to the minus i h0 plus g v t e to the i h0 t. Hmm? Now, if we take the derivative with respect to the time of this operator u, what do we find? i derivative with respect to t of u is, okay, either you, we can take the derivative of this term, and then this drop h0 plus g v, or the other term, which drop uh, h0. So what do you have here? And then this operator commutes with the exponential of itself. So it means that when I put this down, I can put in the middle of the operator. And the same I can do for the other operator. So this is equal to the e to the minus i h0 plus g v t times h0 plus g v minus h0 e to the i h0 t. OK, so this is equal to u times uh, e to the minus i h0 t, there is a g, v e to the i h0 t. Okay? This is essentially is the, it's the same calculation as for the interaction picture, but in a slightly different way. The solution to this equation, that you, uh, with respect to time of u is equal to this, is known. Actually, it is known as in a, in a formal way. So it can be expressed in terms of an anti-time order, uh, anti-time order of the exponential, of an exponential. So the solution is u of t is equal to the anti-time order uh, of the exponential of minus i, the integral from 0 and uh, t of e to the minus i h0 tau g v e to the i h0 tau. OK, I, I, are you familiar with this? All of you, or not? What's the meaning of this? 
Oh, this is an tetam order, sorry. T minus 1. This means that uh, you imagine to expand this exponential, OK, all the terms. So you have 1 minus the first term where there will be an integral in the time. Then the second term, you have another integral. But what you do, the time order tells you that uh, the, in the integration variables, you have that the first integration variable should be always smaller than the second one. Okay? So you fix, uh, for example, you have the second term will be the integral of the tau from 0 to t, the integral from, uh, this is anti-time order, from tau 1 to t, and d tau 2, and so on. Okay, this is uh, the definition. And you can check that this solves the, the, uh, the equation there. It's just a different way to, to, to write this, this unitary operator. Now, So now, when we consider the expectation value of an observable, well, we have psi t, observable psi t, it will be equal to, OK, we decided to split the time evolution in that form. So we'll have psi 0 e to the i h 0 t. Then here, we have the uh, time order operator of the exponential <coughs> of minus, oh, i g integral from 0 t of e to the minus i h 0 tau v i h 0 tau. And here you have the operator. Oh. Here you have the anti-time ordering. Exponential of minus i g integral 0 t e to the minus i h 0 tau g v h 0 tau e to the minus i h 0 t psi 0. So <coughs> I want to time about the state through g, uh, h 0. Mm? So I define this. Uh, my new state will be psi t 0. Let's try this just to remember, which is equal to e to the minus i h 0 t psi 0. And then the operator, the time evolution of the operator will be this object here. I will define all this term here. I will call O, uh, let's uh, use reverse interaction pitch at the time t. OK. Mm? Now, the results I will tell you uh, qualitatively before that, you, that there is a limit when you see this plateau. It means that this here, you can imagine to expand this exponential. And so you see that if g is sufficiently small, this practically doesn't give any contribution. And so you have that this time evolution is simply given by the time evolution under psi d0. Hmm? But now I want to go a bit uh, step further, okay? uh, beyond uh, this uh, very intuitive uh, result. And what I want to do is that uh, saying that the, mm, the time evolution of this operator O in this kind of uh, picture is like the time evolution where the Hamiltonian is time dependent and is given by this oscillatory Hamiltonian. So there is an effective Hamiltonian. Let's write an effective Hamiltonian, which depends on the time, which is uh, given by G uh, e to the minus i h t v e to the minus i h t. Mm. Now let's uh, uh, rescale the time. Maybe le we can do. What is this? Uh, this is the effect meter. Okay. What I want to do was to rescale. H zero. H zero. Sorry. Yes. Okay. What I want to do is that uh, I want to rescale the time in terms of g. Mm. So what happens is that, yeah, there was a integral respect to the tau. Now I put g in the integration variable here, g tau. 
this is the same integral. Now what I uh, what I do is that uh, this uh, yes g tau this will be equal to sorry this is tau divided by g now. Okay. Mm? Okay. This I call tau. This is my new if you want. I, I didn't change anything. I, I just changed variable. So let's introduce then the Hamiltonian, this, this other Hamiltonian, which is given by e to the minus i h0 t over g v e to the i h0 t over g. What I want to do is that I want to fix, consider a time scale where gt is order of 1. Mm? So g is small, t is large, and gt is fixed. And I will call this capital T equal G times T. So now my Hamiltonian as a function of capital T will be just this, T over G. This is an extremely rapidly oscillating term in the Hamiltonian because I'm divided for a very small number. So what happens is that you can, actually you can prove this uh, in a uh, kind of perturbation theory, uh, very careful perturbation theory. And what you find is that to all intents and um, pur purposes here, this is equivalent to the take the time, the, the, the uh, diagonal part of this operator. Mm? It's like when you consider strong coupling expansion. So this will be the diagonal part of V, which is correspond to the average of this operator over, over H0. So you can imagine if there is, okay, if you write this operator as a diagonal part V, diagonal plus off diagonal in the basis diagonalize h naught the diagonal part commute with h naught so this is independent of time the diagonal part let's call it v bar so you have that this you have this contribution v bar then you should uh, con you should consider the off diagonal part but now this off diagonal part gives subleading contribution because of the integration because you, you imagine you are integrating some Hamiltonian which have uh, very uh, rapid oscillations so what you find is that uh, this Hamilton is equivalent to the time average plus order of g. You have correction, which goes to 0 when g approaches 0. Hmm? So this is, uh, in the, uh, if you want, uh, this result is uh, very well known when you consider a strong coupling expansion. When you put some, uh, uh, some coupling constants in your Hamilton, it's very large. And then you, when you take the limit, what happens is that you are effectively in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, um, in the physical sector that you consider, you can just uh, take the, uh, the diagonal part of the rest of the Hamiltonian. So you describe by the diagonal part of the Hamiltonian. If you want, you can go further. In the, you, you can actually compute the, um, an expansion of the integral. And you realize how that the, the subleading term are order of g. You can just expand perturbatively the the exponential. OK, so this is what, uh, what we found. So in this particular limit, when uh, the time is, uh, is order 1 divided by g, what we find is that this time evolution, psi of t, o psi of t, well, should be almost equivalent to psi 0 e to the i <coughs> h0 t e to the i v bar is a capital T here yeah. operator e to the minus i v bar capital T and then e to the minus i h0 t psi 0. Now what happens is that uh, this time this diagonal part of the operator often have as nice uh, locality properties. You can, in particular, if we if you consider this in non-interactive model, you can actually prove that when you consider this uh, this diagonal part as exponentially uh, decaying tails, so it's quasi-local. In interactive model, this is more complicated, and there are some subtleties, but still, uh, it has nice uh, locality properties. So what I what I want to say is that uh, when you consider this part of the time evolution, and O is local, what happens is that uh, the range, the support of this operator, doesn't grow arbitrarily uh, fast. So what happens that, uh, using also the Lee Robinson result that I uh, described some, uh, some, some weeks ago, what you find is that the range of this operator increase like uh, something proportional to capital T. Mm. 
So because capital T is fixed in the limit I'm considering, it means that, okay, maybe I was considering an operator with a range R, then after a time capital T, I will have a range which is R plus twice some effective velocity, capital T. But it will still remain finite. Okay? So this will be more or less a quasi-local operator. If this is a quasi-local operator, then I can apply the result that the, uh, the, the, I can apply uh, the, the GG conjecture. Because now I have that this time t is extremely large hmm, with respect to this, uh, to this range. So I can replace my initial state by state, time of this state, by the GG corresponding to the Hamiltonian H0. So this means that in the limit, in, let's try the limit. The limit is t goes to infinity. G goes to 0. Capital T equal GT fixed. This is the limit I'm considering. In this particular limit, then this becomes equivalent to the trace of my rho GG of the Hamiltonian H0. And then I, I will have the operator at time of orbis in this way. V bar T O e to the minus I V bar T. Okay? But now what happens is that uh, the if uh, the um, in normal situation, if the, you, you have a, a conservation law, a, a, an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, two operators that commute with the Hamiltonian, they commute between one another if there are no special symmetries. Mm? So what I'm saying is that uh, usually, mm, if you have an operator Q1 and 2 that commutes with H, this implies that Q1, Q2 commute. If this doesn't hold, what does it mean? It means that you have exact degeneracy in the spectrum. So this, you don't have always this condition. But what, uh, you, because if this, uh, the spectrum is exactly degenerate, then you can, you can find operators that don't commute. But in general, OK, what you find also the, the set of conservation laws that I uh, work out uh, uh, the, the last week had this property. So they all commute. It's a, a commuting set of conservation laws. If you have this property, so if you consider the system hmm, sufficiently generic without the special symmetry such that this happens, then this V bar hmm, should commute with the GG because both commute with the Hamiltonian. So this means that in this, assuming this, hmm, if I assume this, then I have that this is simply the expectation value gg of the operator. So what we show here is that the time window where uh, of the plateau, this preterminization plateau, is kind of long. Because I also know that uh, if I consider times that scale with g like, uh, so it's times that are the scale like the inverse of g, mm, then at this time still, I can describe the expectation value by means of gg. So the, the, the picture that I erase now, uh, before, eh, uh, of the time evolution of the observable should be something like this. And this is still something a scale like g to the minus 1. This is a very long time. And then at some point, it should happen that we go on the other plateau hmm? in a very complicated way, depending on your interaction v. And uh, uh, OK, I can tell you that, uh, indeed, in some particular case, what uh, the, the way to describe the approach to the thermal state uh, could be employing the Boltzmann equation, the quantum analog of the Boltzmann equation. So what you do is that you, you make some uh, approximation, uh, some assumption, physical assumption, that uh, are assumed to be true when you consider long times. And in that way, you can apparently you can see uh, relaxation to the term, sorry you can see thermalization, and uh, if you use this formalism, uh, the time scale of thermalization seems to be order of g to the minus two. Hmm? This is not a theorem, okay? Uh, this is just a, a very mm, uh, these proofs are not are not rigorous uh, because uh, they are perturbative in a sense, and then uh, the 
uh, not everything is under control when you do this kind of uh, uh, analysis. So in fact, what you can expect, what I would expect is simply that this time scale should be longer than g to the minus 1. So I could expect something like it could go like g to the minus p with p larger than 1, maybe. Could also be exponential, I don't know. Could be, so I, I really don't know. I don't know this, and I, I, I don't think that there are really rigorous results for this, uh, uh, the thermalization in this system. Yeah? Uh, can I just ask you, because I'm a bit confused by the, the scale, so the time scale. So the, the calculation in sketch is for uh, t greater than the g minus 1, right? The calculation, I believe, no, is the same order now. Here we just consider the same order, g minus 1. I fixed g times t. So this means that in this time scale, which is goes like g minus 1, it's just constant here, okay. apart from correction order of g. Then for in a different time scale, which I don't know, which could be g to the minus 2 if nothing strange happens, then I will have, I will see that this uh, uh, time evolution will move, this expectation value will move to the thermal expectation value. In, it is this, because it's t. t divided by g is t. So, uh, yeah, t, okay, yeah. I need this to replace psi t by rotation. Okay. Yeah. So still you have to find the bar and then you have to find the time scale. Yeah. 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 Uh, time window which is scales in a different way, not g minus 1. Mm, at g minus 1 you don't see anything. And this is what uh, was shown numerically also. You don't see anything in this time window. It's just it's approaching some stationary value, which differ from the gg1 just the order of g because of those corrections and, uh, and other corrections. So something very small differ. Mm. Can be approximated by the gg up to small corrections. OK, but uh, uh, in order to, to, to prove this, I use this property. OK? Uh, as I told you before, this in generally happens, but this is not, uh, there are exceptions. And uh, I, uh, I want to, uh, where do I do this? Yeah, let's say, OK? Uh, just uh, again, be sure. This is an argument to say that uh, this time scale is bigger than g minus 1. Yes. It's just that, but I, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't want to go into this problem so of affining the time scale uh, no, no, no. Uh, now. So I'm just uh, you can expect from perturbative argument that the scale is like g minus 2, but then it's not clear whether you can apply this kind of perturbation theory. So I, I just prefer to just tell you that maybe you should go. I don't know what happens. But at least I'm pretty sure that in this time scale, nothing should happen. OK? But OK, nothing happens as long as you have this condition. Hmm? And it's not always the case. And then I will give you a very uh, um, relevant case when this should happen. This is not expected to happen. And a relevant case is the Hamiltonian of the uh, an Heisenberg uh, model okay? with uh, an interaction of the form, uh, if you consider this model, SL. This is an interactive model. It's an integrable model. It's the, the first model you consider when you, uh, when you want to model uh, ferromagnetic uh, interactions okay, in, uh, uh, in chains. And what you have is that this is a very symmetric model. In particular, there is a rotational symmetry hmm, about any, any direction. So this means that this Hamiltonian commutes with uh, SZ, okay, but it also commutes with Sx and with Sy, with all the spin in any direction, a total spin. But Sx, Sy, Sz don't commute between one another. So it means that we are losing this property. Mm? And indeed, well, you can, uh, we can immediately see that there are consequences here. Because now, when you uh, imagine to, uh, to compute the GG of this model, no? 
let's assume that you are, uh, your initial state have, have a privileged direction in terms of the spin. For example, it's a ferromagnetic state, it could be. So all spin in the z direction. You started by that. No, no, in that case, no, it would be true. But anyway, there is a, a, a privileged direction. With all the spin tend to be aligned in the z direction. So when you compute the GG, because of that, you will have, for example, that the expectation value of SZ will have some uh, non-zero value, because they tend to be in that direction. And the other expectation value, say, they will be zero. Mm. Now, if you put here an interaction, V, mm, that instead it uh, uh, breaks the symmetry. For example, the, the interaction that I can put is uh, sum over L of S, L, X. So now I put an interaction which is not aligned uh, as the initial state. It's in another direction. This operator commutes with the Hamiltonian. So this is my V. Yeah? This is what I call V. Now, because this operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, V bar is just given by itself. It commutes. It's already diagonal. So in this case, you have the V bar is simply given by Sx, the spin in the x direction. But the spin in the direction doesn't commit with rho gg because it was aligned in z direction. So what happens is that if you now you stop at this point of the calculation, you can't go here. And what you have is that this, uh, in this limit, you will find oscillations in oscillatory behavior in terms of the spin. So if uh, O, for example, is the spin in a given direction, because of this rotation here, you will have a rotation in the other axis. So what will happen is that uh, when you, if you sketch the time evolution, uh, let's say the time evolution of uh, SZ hmm? as a function of time. So I said that the uh, initial is a bit polarized. So let's say this is 1. This is when it starts. So I don't know what will happen here. Uh, OK, I know that the, uh, the initial time will tend to HG, which is polarized, something like this. And then it should start oscillating because of the interaction on the time scale g minus 1. So you should have very, very slow oscillations, hmm? which scale as uh, g with a frequency which is, uh, no, yes, which is uh, g, proportional to g. So this frequency, the, uh, the gt, uh, yes, yeah, so the gt, 1 over g. So this, the wavelength should be order 1 over g. So very slow oscill oscillatory behavior. Hmm? So this is a case when you don't see really a plateau. So you have a plateau for a time scale which is uh, shorter than g to the minus 1. You have the relaxation to the gg, which is this, if you want. So this is my standard pre-thermalization plateau. And then I consider the other time scale. And because of this, in this model, I have this kind of oscillation. And then in the end, because this interaction, OK, in this case, no, but uh, uh, if you assume that the interaction uh, mm, somehow breaks integrability, you should have that this somehow then will reach the, uh, the thermal expectation value. Mm? So this, is, uh, this kind of oscillation is what you find uh, generally if you have a finite number of conservation laws that don't commute between one another, like in this, uh, in this particular model. Mm. So I think that the, in this case, it's impossible to have something more, uh, more complicated than this. So either you have something trivial, you, so you remain on the pretermization plateau, or you find oscillations. There are, however, models where you can have uh, more interesting behavior. And this happens when you have uh, an infinite number of conservation that don't commute with one another. So you can see a non-abelian what are uh, known as non-abelian integrable models, or super-integrable models. Hmm? And I will give you an example, because it's the example that we consider since the beginning without telling you that they have this uh, special symmetry. The example is the quantum XY model. So if you now consider the Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian, sum over L, OK, sum over L, of 1 plus some parameter, gamma, sigma Lx, sigma L plus 1, x plus 1 minus gamma 
over 4 sigma L y sigma L plus over two. sigma L plus 1 y mm? so this is a non-interacting Hamiltonian it's part of the model that we studied that we considered before and generally, okay, uh, we also put, I when you consider the easy model, the easy model corresponds to this, plus h was something like this. If you put gamma, set gamma equal to 1, okay, that is the easy model. What I'm saying now, that don't put a magnetic field. So we remove this term. And we consider just a linear combination of xx and yy. Mm? And, the, okay, we already mentioned the case gamma equals 0, which is the xx model, which is just free fermions. Uh, is a uh, is an open term, xx plus yy, if you write in terms of uh, uh, fermions. Okay, so in this model, what you can f see is that uh, the ch set of charges is larger than the one that I presented you. And you could say, how is that possible? Because, okay, I, I told you how to construct the charges in this model. You, you can just define the symbol. And then from the symbol, you have to find all the operators that commute with the symbol. No? And we had a 2 by 2 matrix. And so for a 2 by 2 matrix, there are only two operators, two matrices that can commute. So there is nothing more. We can't find anything more. The, the degree of freedom that we didn't use when we compute the charges is that. Uh, Maybe there could be conservation laws that are not one side shift invariant. That are not invariant under shifted by one side. Because when I define the Fourier transform here, I define a Fourier transform for every side. Hmm? So I assume that everything was translation invariant. Instead, maybe, uh, as, and this is what happens in this model, there are conservation laws that break this symmetry and are translation invariants, for example, every two sides instead of just one. And how can we realize that there are these conservation laws here? OK, up to here, it doesn't change anything. OK, this was our matrix, matrix H, circular matrix, which has this structure. Now what I can do is that I can reinterpret the matrix in a, the, as another block circular matrix. Instead of assuming that these are the blocks, these two by two blocks, I could just say, just say this is a matter of convention. I could just say, no, well, now I, I put together two sides the two sides in the chain. And so this com consists in uh, into essentially this. So instead of considering these blocks, you consider these blocks, which are 4 by 4 matrices now. I can do a sa the same. Nothing changes. I have to be careful that now the free transform is not every size, but every two sides. So I'm decreasing the effective dimension of my chain by a factor of 2, in a sense. So here, the, the momentum. The momentum here was generating translation by one side. The momentum in the new, if you, if you now use this other interpretation, would degenerate translation by two sides. OK, this is the, the difference. But you just write the same here. You just put a two factor of two because uh, you have a over two here. And what you have is that you, you can define the symbol again, which now will be a four by four matrix. Hmm? And what happens so special is that this 4 by 4 matrix is degenerate. OK, so we don't have time to, to compute it, but I, I, I just show you. What's happening here. I show you the, the uh, Result and what you have is, if you consider all this Hamiltonian, I write for you the symbol of the Hamiltonian, the two by two symbol. So if you assume, uh, if you use the the same representation that we employed before, and now I put a pedix here just to remember that they, I'm considering translation by one side, hmm? this one. So, okay, translation shifts by one side. OK, this is equal to, you can check it, it's j. There is a j that I probably didn't put here. j cosine k sigma y minus gamma sine k sigma z, uh, sigma x. 
this is the symbol. If you consider just the uh, two by two uh, symbol um, uh, blocks. Now, if we extend to four by four blocks, we find this H two is equal to minus j cosine k over two sigma x plus sine k over two sigma y cosine k over two sigma y minus gamma sine k over two sigma x. So it has this kind of factorized form. OK, now because it's a 4 by 4 matrix, I can describe by the uh, tensor product of Pauli matrices. Mm? And then you can check that it has this kind of structure. So it's just this, uh, uh, this, is, this uh, mm. is like this, uh, um, this operator acts on, on one side, for example, if you imagine, on one part of the space, and this other operator on the other part of the space. This is the meaning of the tensor product. This is clear? Uh, yes, OK. <coughs> so we have this operator. Now, if you compute the, uh, the eigenvalues of this, the eigenvalues of this is, uh, can be computed very easily uh, because it has this kind of uh, 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 factorized form. So are just the product of the eigenvalues of this times the eigenvalues of this. Mm? What you find is are equal to plus or minus the eigenvalues, sorry, eigenvalues. will be plus or minus uh, j square root of cosine squared k over 2 plus gamma squared sin sine squared k over 2. There are four. Oh, this is a 4 by 4 matrix. But there are only two different eigenvalues. Each eigenvalue has degeneracy 2. Hmm? So you can imagine if I diagonalize the matrix, I will have uh, something like this. Uh, uh, let's call this uh, plus minus epsilon. So I will have epsilon, epsilon, minus epsilon, minus epsilon. Okay. This is my, my matrix in the basis that I diagonalize it. Mm? If now I, uh, I compute the conservation, okay. Um, if you follow okay, the, the, the approach that I told you the last time, so we have to find all the matrices that commute with this particular matrix here. So let's assume that we are working the diagonal basis, because it's convenient. So which are the, the matrices that commute with this, the independent matrices? So you have uh, itself, hmm, commutes with itself, the identity, commutes always. Then uh, you, what you have, you can have clearly, well, clearly this 0, 0, 0 commute in this basis. No? You can also put uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, commute with this. 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1. They all commute with the matrix. OK? But not, these are not the only matrices that commute. Because now, as this matrix uh, uh, acts like the identity on each sector. Every matrix commutes with the identity. So in fact, you can also consider something like a path. A, B, C, D, 0, 0, this is going to commute. So in particular, if I want this to be independent of the other one, I could put uh, 0 here. Hmm? I can put uh, 1, 1, for example. This commutes. And, uh, and, so, and so on. You can, you have, you can have this, you can have... Uh, you can have uh, a Pauli matrix here. This commutes, or a generic Pauli matrix on the other part. So we have uh, more conservation laws hmm? that uh, just consider the diagonal conservation laws. You can see, you can check that the, all these diagonal conservation laws are the analog of the one that we computed already, that were one size shift invariant. So what you find is that uh, all these conservation laws correspond actually to charges that are invariant by a shift of one side. These new conservation laws, instead, no. They are invariant under shift of two sides. But there is something more uh, stronger here, is that, that these 
conservation laws don't commute between one another. Because as I show you here, you can put any Pauli matrix. And Pauli matrices don't commute. So we found uh, a larger set of conservation laws, which all of those commute with the Hamiltonian, with the symbol of the Hamiltonian, and so with the Hamiltonian. But they don't commute with one another. Hmm? This is why it's, uh, it's called the non-abelian uh, integrable model, because they don't commute. And uh, I could list them, but uh, it's not really particularly interesting. Well, you, 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 you could actually easily find all the conservation. You can imagine to write. I can tell you that uh, all these charges have a factorized form, like this. Hmm? And so you can just play with the Pauli matrices and see all, uh, all this independent set, how many charges you can construct. I can tell you that uh, you can construct eight families. Eight families of charges in this way. Hmm? These eight families of charges, and there are four of them. Four of them are shift invariant. So this means that you can write them like a sum over L of Q L, let's say. And then there are four of them are uh, two side shift invariant. And it can be written, let's say, should be, I think, something like this you could do in some case. You have these kind of objects that commute to be the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian was translation invariant. Eh? So the Hamiltonian is translation invariant, but you find objects that uh, are not translation invariant and then commute with the Hamiltonian. Now, unfortunately, OK, I, we, can, we don't have time to do the calculation. I tell you what you find. Let's assume now that you apply uh, all the, um, w what I told you before. So you, you want to describe the time evolution in the scaling limit gt fixed hmm? and t large. And then you have to compute the, uh, the average of the, uh, of the perturbation v. Hmm? You can do. You can imagine, for example, to, to consider this model perturbed by a small magnetic field. So you can solve this model, because this model breaks all the symmetries there. And then you compute this uh, uh, time average uh, uh, interaction. And then what you find is that uh, you don't have these oscillations anymore in this model. What you have is a more interesting behavior, because you have that in the time scale 1 over g, you have that this will move on a different plateau. Hmm? This is a time scale g to the minus 1. It will be a different plateau. And then here, after that, you will have if the, if the model is generic, OK, not in this case, but if you imagine to include here also Q plus something weird, hmm, that it will become a generic model. And then you will have pre -thermaliz uh, you have thermalization here. So this is why we call them pre-relaxation. OK, in this model, in particular, you don't have thermalization without the, the other term. So you have uh, this, this plateau here you can call pre-relaxation, because it's just a relaxation to a GG. So you have the analog, in, the analog in integrable models of pre-thermalization in this model. So you see the emergence of a plateau before the, the, uh, the relaxation to a GG in this time scale. Hmm? If you break also integrability, then you have another time scale, which tells you that in the end you should also uh, reach the thermal expectation value. Hmm? OK. So uh, yeah, with this I will. Uh, I, s I will stop uh, this, uh, this part on pre because I, I, I think it's more interesting for you to, uh, I know, to discuss a bit more the presence of inhomogeneities in quantum quenches. So next time, I will, uh, I will prepare something on uh, the time evolution in the presence of inhomogeneities. Hmm? What do we know? Probably, OK, we won't have time to do many calculations. So I will uh, try just to give you a picture and then to uh, to, to show you the equations that you have to solve in order to, hmm, to find the result. Okay. Yes? Uh, one question. Uh, what is the time scale for the 
relaxation. Free relaxation is g to the minus 1. You, uh, all, this, all this thing that you see is g minus 1. It's not just uh, all this here. Yeah? Happens at g minus 1. Yes. G is this. Yeah. It will be in the, if you go in the thermal, it will be let's assume g to the minus two. Hmm? So if you consider g to the minus two, then you will have uh, some. Uh, yeah. This will happen g to the minus two. Let's say. This all this region, it's g to the minus one. So you see that uh, it's interesting because in, um, in this kind of condition, when you perturb systems, then you can find very, very interesting time evolution, very non-trivial time evolution, which still uh, somehow can be, um, can be solved exactly. So what I mean is that when we put this small perturbation break integrability, in general, OK, you could say, OK, we can't do anything now because the model is integral. Instead, we can do something. So it's possible at least to describe this time region, g to the minus 1, mm, uh, exactly, uh, up to correction, OK, order of g. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it can describe the, the behavior here. And then you can also go a bit beyond mm, using what is called the continuous unitary transformation. And uh, in particular, the, uh, this was a work by Kirain, Fabian Esler, and Neil Robinson, and uh, remember the last one, uh, and um, Salvatore Mammana, I think. And what they showed, they were able to compute the, um, the correction to this behavior that I'm telling you. So here I tell you that you have a plateau. Hmm? And then the, the, the plateau is a, bit, is a bit, you have a correction order of g that comes from my assumption that what I, what I showed before. They actually were able to compute also the correct, to include the correction, OK, with this mechanism, just using integrability. So what I mean is that uh, it's interesting that uh, despite you consider generic, uh, in the generic model, there is a time window where you can, uh, you can actually um, obtain some exact result. Uh, OK, so. okay at least I thank you and uh, see you so next week. You.